My, how delighted I am to see this crowd here tonight. A crowd of all ages and all levels of life. And everywhere I go, I say, irrespective of your age, go and get you some learning. Go and get you some learning so that other people will not look down on you. And then go and get you some more learning so you won't look down on other people. <laughs> but haven't you noticed if you know a little something, the world doesn't want to give you credit. And if you're not sure about some things, they'll brag on you. When Christopher Columbus left home, he didn't know where he was going. When he got here, he didn't know where he was. When he returned home, he didn't know where he'd been. <laughs> and we give him credit for discovering America. <laughs> and then while you're getting your learning, learn to use what you know. Some years ago, a boy whose parents had no formal training wanted their son to have educational advantages, so they got their monies together and sent this boy away to school. And after the first year, when the boy returned home, he was eager to let his parents know what he'd learned in school. That morning, the father went out and killed two ducks. The mother dressed these ducks and baked them real brownly and called them to dinner. And the boy said, this is my opportunity to let my parents know what I've learned in school. When they were seated at the table, the boy said, Daddy, there are three ducks in that dish. The father said, no, I didn't kill but two. The boy said, oh, but there are three ducks in that dish. And the mother said, I didn't bake but two. The boy still insisted that there are three ducks in that dish. And he set out to try to explain. He said, you see, you take a certain potion from this duck and an equal potion from this duck and put these potions together and this will equal that and that will equal this. And the more he tried to explain, the more confused the father became. So he just bowed his head and said, Gracious Lord, we do humbly thank thee for what we are about to receive for the nourishment of our bodies. For Christ our Redeemer's sake, amen. And he forked up one duck and put in the mother's plate. And he forked up the other duck and put in his plate and said, Now you help yourself to that third duck. I'm using for a subject this evening sharing our life in Christ in service. Sharing our life in Christ in service. The text comes from our Lord's Gospel according to Luke, the tenth chapter. And I'll begin reading with verse 25. Luke 10 and 25. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said unto him, what is written in the law, and how readest thou? And he answered and said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. 
I want to lay emphasis on the latter portion of the 28th verse. He answered and said unto him, Thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. You know what to say? Now go do it. You've preached. Now go practice what you've preached. Isn't it strange that everybody wants to live, but he spends his time dying? You will agree, I'm sure, that we live in a sadly sick society. Men still think that they can find peace of mind in pills. They're trying to eat their way to ecstasy. They're trying to drink their way to pleasure. They're trying to smoke their way to settled nerves. They're trying to puff their way to popularity and push their way to power. They try to bully their way to friendship and bum their way to world peace. But I've come tonight to tell you that I know where a poor man has a chance. That a sick man can get well. And that an ignorant man can become wise. That a bad man can be made good. A good man can be made better and even a dead man can be made alive in Jesus Christ. One day an expert at Moses' law came to test Jesus' orthodoxy by asking him this question. Teacher, what does a man need to do to live now and to live forever in heaven? And Jesus replied, what does Moses' law say about it? And the man replied, Moses' law said, Thou must love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy strength, and with all thy mind. And then you must love your neighbor just as you love yourself. Jesus said, That's right. Go do it, and you shall live. You know what to say? Go do it. We not only must say what's right, but we must do what's right. If you really want to live, you must share your life in Christ in service. First, you must come to Him who is life, who has come that we might have life and that we might have it more abundantly. Now we are meeting against the backdrop of mounting world tension. This hate-filled world is desperate for a decent way of life. Now I'm too ignorant to speak wisely and I trust them too wise to speak ignorantly. But a man does not have to be listed in the who's who to know what's what today. As he stands with a newspaper in one hand and a Bible in the other with his eyes focused on the television and his ears tuned to the radio, he can hear of wars and rumors of wars rumbling around the world. He can see astounding world events tumbling over each other in rapid succession, rushing on the ruin. Civilization is torn with degradation and flirting with doom and disaster. High-mindedness runs the streets like a mad dog beating an uncertain path. Selfishness has evaporated the milk of human kindness. 
and pain and panic are chasing each other like June bugs playing in the summer sun. Paradise has been turned into pandemonium and puny men are still piddling around with passing days. Now under the magic of science, distance has disappeared. We no longer measure distance by the miles, but by the hours. Los Angeles is 10 hours from London. That simply says that isolationism is dead and buried without the slightest hope of a resurrection. Now whether we realize it or not, we are interdependent and we are interrelated. We cannot live without each other and then we have not learned to live with each other. Unless we learn to live with each other, it is doubtful that we shall live at all. You see, science has given us proximity, but it cannot give us community. And proximity without community spells trouble. And that's where we are now. If you really want to live, You've got to come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let him give you life that will never end. And then go and share that life that you have with others. If you really want to live, you must love God and neighbor in that order. You know, the trouble with us in our day is we are trying to love each other, we are trying to get along with each other without God. In the last decade or so, we have spent millions trying to get men to live peaceably one with the other. Now, you will know that men... Quit acting like brothers in Cain and Abel's day. We say we have a racial problem, our problem is racial, but I submit to you that our problem is not a skin problem, it's a sin problem. Cain and Abel were the sons of the same father and mother and thereby of the same race. And Cain killed Abel. And then, if you think that it's just a skin problem, if you're going down a dark stretch of the road at night and you hear some footsteps behind you, you don't wonder what color that man is. You want to know the condition of his heart. <laughs> we must love God and then neighbor in that order. I said we're trying to pay men to live peaceably one with the other. Don't you know God is the only one who has to love who loves without a reason. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But human beings love for a reason. I hear the psalmist saying, I love the Lord because he has heard my voice and my supplication. Because. But God loves us without our being lovable or lovely. God loves us. He does not love us because we are valuable, but we are valuable because God loves us. God loves us not because Jesus died for us, but Jesus died for us because God loves us. And 
And if God love us and our reason for being here in this world is that we might glorify Him. Not glorify ourselves or our neighbor, but glorify God. We must love God and neighbor in that order. Our theology has got to be expressed in our sociology. One cannot be human alone. It takes God and another. But you know, we are forever blowing bubbles. Looking for ships that never come in. Chasing pots of gold at the end of receding rainbows. Now when a child blows bubbles, he's not concerned about values. He's thrilled as long as the bubble lasts, and when, he, when it bursts, he simply blows another. How do you expect your ships to come in when you've sent no ships out? And you never will find that proverbial pot of gold because you try to ignore him who has the rainbow wrapped around his shoulder. You remember back during the 60s, the offbeat theologians romped around in their subsurface playpens and emerged and announced that God was dead. Now that shouldn't have been surprising to us because the Bible has informed us that the fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. And when I first heard that absurd statement, it made me want to ask some stupid and senseless questions. Like, who assassinated God? And what coroner was called? And who signed his death certificate? And who was so well acquainted with the one pronounced dead that he could identify the deceased? In what obituary column did you find his name? And why was I not notified? I'm a member of the family. <laughs> God is spirit. He does not die by assassination. He does not die by pronouncement. He does not die by denial. He just does not die. He's as real today as he was to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. If you'll trust him, he'll be as true to you as he was to Abram. When Abram was called to go out, not knowing whether he went. If you'll trust him, he will be as evident to you as he was to Moses when God manifested himself in a burning bush. Now when they couldn't get anywhere with the God is dead idea, now in these seventies, one of the top theological questions is, where did God come from? Now the primary purpose of God in creation was to prepare a moral being spiritual and intellectually capable of worshiping him. When heaven and earth were yet unmade, when there was empty blackness and void formlessness and darkness was on the face of the deep, when time was yet unknown, thou in thy bliss and majesty did live and love alone. He called light out of darkness, he called cosmos out of chaos, he called order out of confusion. But the question still clamors for an answer, where did God come from? And the answer is he came from nowhere. Now that's theologically correct and it's biblically sound. For Habakkuk said, I saw him when he left the hills of Teman, the Holy One from Mount Perrin, and Teman simply means nothing or nowhere. So he came from nowhere. I made that statement in Detroit some time ago, and a man talked with me after the service, and he said, Preacher, let's be reasonable about this thing. You up there talking about God came from nowhere. That doesn't make sense. Let's be reasonable about it. I said, All right. If you just want to be reasonable about it, the reason God came from nowhere is because there wasn't anywhere for him to come from. And coming from nowhere, he stood on nothing. And the reason he had to stand on nothing, there was nowhere for him to stand. 
and standing on nothing, he reached out where there was nowhere to reach and he caught something when there was nothing to catch and hung something on nothing and told it to stay there. <laughs> now you can, you can find that in Job 26 and 7 that he hung this world on nothing. And standing on nothing, he took the hammer of his own will and struck the anvil of his omnipotence. And sparks flew there from, and he caught them on the tips of his fingers and flung them out into space and bedecked the heavens with stars. And nobody said a word. The reason nobody said anything, there wasn't anybody there to say anything. So God himself said, that's good. And if you really want to live, you've got to love God and neighbor. You must love God with all of your heart, soul, strength, mind, and your neighbor just as you love yourself. Some people think that just one good quality makes them Christian and makes them acceptable in the sight of God. Everybody here has one or two things going for them. But it takes more than just one or two things. You must love God with your soul, your mind, your heart, your strength, and then neighbor as yourself. You know, some people who have talents, well, if they sing, they think that all they have to do is come here on Sunday morning or wherever your church is and stand and sing and then go on and live like you want to live. You not only must have the talent, but you must use it for the glory and the honor of the Lord. And then there are some people, and I, I believe that every, every Christian ought to be a tither. That's the minimum. And then give generously of that that you have left. But now, if a person is a tither and gives generously, if he's not careful, he'll get to the point where he thinks that whatever he says in the church ought to go because he pays his money. It takes something else besides money. And then, then uh, we have some prayer specialists. We have some people who can order God around. They can tell Him where to go and what to do and when they want it and how they want it done. Just like God doesn't know how to run this world. Some talk to Him like they're trying to pick at the throne of grace. Trying to get Him to change His mind. Now, I'm not knocking prayer. We cannot get along without it. And every day of our lives ought to be punctuated with periods of prayer. But I'm saying that you must do something else beside pray. There was a boy who was on his way home one night. And he passed a cemetery and he heard a strange rustling in the trees. Now, this boy had been by there many nights before, but this is the first night he heard that strange sound. And it frightened him, and he ran with all of his might and prayed as he ran, Lord, help me to run. Lord, help me to run. Now, he was praying, and he went on to say, Lord, I don't want you to do it all by yourself. i tell you what you do. If you'll pick them up, 
I'll put them down. <laughs> now, you might not care too much for his theology, but that boy had something. With all of the strength, all of the resources that God gives us, we ought to use them for His glory and His honor. So, we must do something else besides pray. Any individual who thinks that just one good quality makes him acceptable in the sight of God and serviceable in the kingdom, it reminds me of bees making honey. There is a bee, you know, that uh, just makes honey out of one flower. When you taste it, it's all right, but you can tell that something is lacking. There is another bee, when he gets ready to make honey, he will go to the clover field and suck some of the nectar from the clover. And then he'll go to the rosebud and get some of its sweetness. And then he'll go to the meadow and get some of what the daisy has to offer. And then he'll fly over the mountain and bring back some of the liquid fragrance of a morning glory. He'll come back by the peach orchard and light in a peach blossom. And then he'll go to his little laboratory and he'll mix it all up. You've got some real honey then. And if you want your life serviceable in the kingdom of our Lord, you've got to start at Abraham's tent and get you some faith. You've got to visit Moses at Midian and get you some preparation. You've got to go up on the mountain where Elijah is and get you some fire. You've got to go to Job's house and get you some patience. You've got to go to Paul's dungeon and get you some determination and missionary zeal. You've got to plow through the word of God and stop on the Jericho road long enough for the good Samaritan to teach you how to love your neighbor. And then you've got to go to Calvary and get you some love and go down in the empty tomb and get you some eternal life and go somewhere in your secret closet and mix it all up in prayer. You'll be serviceable in the kingdom of our Lord. That's the reason Paul said, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. Christ is the supreme pattern for Christian living. You copy others and you copy their faults. You copy Christ and there's no fault to copy. Not only does he set before us the perfect structure of his own flawless career, but he furnishes every one of us who desires it a blueprint for our own lives. But to build after his model, you must have his mind. And what kind of a mind does he have? He has a mind devoted to God and the good. He has a mind of high aspiration and humble service. He has a mind of faith and faithfulness. Of faith and works. You know, we ought to love God and neighbor. We must worship God and witness to every creature. You know, some want to select the people to whom they witness. And the commission is to every creature. We want to, we, we want to find somebody who looks like we want him to look and sound like we want him to sound. But it's to every creature. We must love God. We must worship God. And then we must witness to every creature. We are to witness not only by lip, but we must witness by life. We must not only have a Christian vocabulary, but we must have Christian experience. You know, some people think that the Christian religion is just uh, something that you talk about. And they think that they can talk their religion. You know, if we were to stop here now, and just let everybody talk. We used to have call it having a testifying meeting and my grandmother called it a test line meeting <laughs> but if you let everybody talk in the next in the next five minutes there would be a lot of weeping and crying I'm a Christian 
You may not know it, but I'm a Christian. Let me tell you, child, if you're a Christian, somebody else is going to know it. By their fruits, ye shall know them. We must have faith and we must have works. Not only must we have a Christian vocabulary, but Christian experience. We not only must say what's right, but we must do what's right. We need a program, yes, but we also need a ministry. And I'm impressed with the many ministries of this church. We need faith and we need works. You see, faith without works is dead. And works without faith is futile. You see, faith and works are the wings of the same bird. A bird can't fly with just one wing. It doesn't make any difference how strong and how limber the wing of Faith is that bird can't fly with faith alone. And it doesn't matter how strong and how limber the wing of works is. That bird can't fly with works alone. If he's to fly, he must mount up on faith and works. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captive, recovering the sight of the blind, and set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Now, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, that's something that you say. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. That's something that you do. To preach deliverance to the captive, that's something that you say. Recovering the sight of the blind, that's something that you do. To set at liberty them that are bruised, that's something that you do. To preach the acceptable year of the Lord, that's something that you say. So saying and doing has got to go hand in hand. Faith and works. Now faith is essential. Because if faith sees the invisible, it believes the incredible, and receives the impossible. Faith is essential because it's the only approach to God. He that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He's a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Faith is your invitation to let God use you on His own terms. Now just, just for a moment, think what would happen right here tonight if everybody here would just allow the Lord to have His way in your life. Why, a revival would break out right here. You know, we all try to pray, Lord, send us a revival. We need revival. Lord, and He has said, if my people which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, you won't have to worry. I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sins and I'll heal their land. So the next move is ours. God's ready. Are you ready? Men want to be saved but they want to be saved on their own terms. If you'll allow God to use you on His own terms, you'll not only see what God can do for you, but you'll see what He can do with you and through you. Faith is the link that binds our nothingness to almightiness. Faith is human weakness laying hold on divine strength. Now, if a thing is possible, it can be done by skill and experience. But if a thing is impossible, it can be done only by faith. Now, faith is not going to stop the storm, but I tell you what it'll do. It'll help you to stand it. This old world is tattered and torn, and 
faith will take the tangled threads of men's hopes and knit them in the tapestries of fadeless glory. Faith will help you to face life's music when you don't even like the tune. The venture of faith gives reality to our hopes. It will cause you to live on invisible means of support. You can eat well in the wilderness and sing the doxology in a dungeon. Faith is essential, but faith is not enough by itself. That's just the starting point. Our Lord gave a demonstration of faith and works. It was on the occasion of the Feast of the Tabernacle. A blind man was sitting by the wayside begging. Now other men became blind, but this man was born like that. This man had never seen the face of his loved ones. He'd never seen a sunrise or a sunset. This man had never seen color blushing a rose. This man had felt raindrops, but he'd never seen clouds floating overhead. This man had heard thunder, but he'd never seen lightning flash. This man is in a pitiful condition, sitting there, blind, begging, but the disciples were interested only to a point. They were only interested in the cause. They were not interested in a cure. They just wanted to have something to talk about. They just wanted to have it said when they got in their rap sessions that we know what caused this blindness. They were only, only interested in theology. And they called themselves asking a deep theological question. Master, who did sin? This man or his parents that he was born blind. But Jesus turned their theology into doxology. For he said, neither, but that the works of God might be made manifest in him. Now Jesus is not saying that the man has never sinned or that the parents had not sinned because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But what Jesus is saying, that no one's sin caused this blindness. I can hear Jesus saying, I had him born like that for just such time as this. I had him born like that so that when men run low on faith, I had him born like that so that when men think that faith is all they need, I had him born like that, that I might glorify God. And he set out to give this demonstration, and he's going to do it in slow motion. Now Jesus could have just willed, and the man's eyes would have come open. But he takes his time. He's going to demonstrate. The importance of faith and works. He takes his time. He spit on the ground. He mixes the spit and the clay. And then he takes his time and smooths it on the man's eyes. And tells him to go and wash in the pool. This man first of all had to have faith in Jesus. If he had no faith, this blind man would have resented. He would have protested. He would have said, why this man is mocking me. I'm, I've been blind all my life and uh, here he is putting mud and spit on my eyes. But there was something in Jesus' voice that caused the man to want to try it. And he started out just like he was. I said faith is a starting point. That's a good starting point. That's the only starting point. This man got up and went straight to the pool. Now he possibly didn't have 
a CNI dog. He possibly didn't have uh, know anything about radar, but he went straight to the pool. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I'm weak, but thou art mighty, hold me with thy powerful hand. You know, if you will go in the faith that the Lord gives you, if you will use that little, He'll increase it while you're in the journey. And then when you come to the end of the journey, you can testify that the journey has been joyful. You know, when you get in your car and start out for home tonight, you may not have enough light to shine all the way home. But as your vehicle moves, the light moves. When you turn right, the light turns right. When you turn left, the light turns left. When you go up the hill, the light's up the hill. When you get in the valley, the light's in the valley. And after a while, you've got light all the way home. Use the faith that the Lord gives you and He will increase it. Yes, He will. He'll, he'll strengthen you as you obey. This man went on to the pool, and when he got there, he didn't just stand and shout about his faith. This man had to work. This man washed. And when he washed, when he worked, when he coupled his faith and his work, his eyes came open. And now he's got something to shout about. Now he can tell others what good things the Lord has done for him. I once was blind, but now I see. Oh, I used to murmur and complain and argue with life. But when I found Jesus precious to my soul, I moved off of Complaint Avenue and am now living on Thanksgiving Boulevard. Praise the Lord. This man has something to shout about now. He has faith and works. If I walk in the pathway of duty, if I work until the close of the day, I shall see the great king in his beauty when I've gone the last mile of the way. When I've gone the last mile of the way, I'll rest at the close of the day. And I know there are joys that await me when I've gone the last mile of the way. I have faith in Him, yes. But I put my faith to work. And I'm going to work until the day is over. Jesus said, Occupy until I come. Occupy. Work until I come. You know, many people, instead of occupying until He comes, they are occupied with His coming. They're trying to pinpoint the time of His coming. So, but it's always sitting around trying to figure out just when he's coming. Now I know he's coming. And I can't say soon. I don't know when. But he's coming. Instead of occupying until he comes, they're occupied with his coming. They're trying to pinpoint the time of His coming. And every once in a while, somebody will uh, make an announcement that I know that He's coming on such and such a day. A few years ago, somebody made an announcement that Christ would return on a March the 16th. People got all excited and they began to call and say, Pastor, what do you think about that announcement? 
that Christ is going to return on March the 16th. I said, I don't think a thing about it. And if it disturbs you, you go out to the nearest cemetery, and when you see the tombstone still standing upright, don't worry. For when He comes, the dead in Christ are going to rise first. When He comes, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, the other prophets, are going to rise and run the streets, and everybody they see, they're going to say, I told you so. When He comes, Abraham's going to nudge Sarah and say, Wake up, Sarah, the Lord's here. When He comes, David's going to ask for his harp and play once more, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. We need to work now. While it's day, for when the night cometh, no man can work. We need to work until He comes. You know, after a while, we're going to have some more leaders. Oh, Pastor Logan, these other pastors, these missionaries, are just serving now. After a while, we're going to have some more leaders. You remember when Jesus got ready to confirm His divine mission in the minds of men, He carried Peter, James, and John up on the mountain of transfiguration. He brought Moses and Elijah down to represent heaven. And there on that mountain, in that conference, there was just one item on the agenda. Jesus talked about dying. He talked about dying until his countenance changed. He talked about dying until Peter got happy and said, let's build three tabernacles. He talked about dying. And I believe, I believe that he appointed Moses to lead that crowd who has died in the Lord. And I believe that he appointed Elijah to lead that crowd who will be still alive when he comes. You know, Elijah didn't die. He just caught a fiery chariot and went on home. And I believe, I believe that while we are getting ready... I believe that we're going to sing a double anthem. I'm glad that those who will be still alive will not go off and leave those in the grave. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. We're going to sing this double anthem. Elijah's crowd is going to sing, O death! Where is thy sting? And Moses' crowd's going to sing, O grave, where is thy victory? And then we're going to all join in the chorus and sing, Thanks be to God which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll be caught up together to meet Him in the air. Somebody said, We'll walk in Jerusalem Just like John, but the Bible says we'll be caught up to meet him in the air. Somebody says we'll get on board an old ship of Zion. She has landed a many a thousand. She has landed my old father. She has landed my old mother. But the book says we'll be caught up to meet him in the air. And then somebody says we are climbing Jacob's ladder and every round goes higher and higher. But the Bible says we'll be caught up to meet him in the air. Now, it used to be a song, don't hear it so much now. Lord, I want two wings to veil my face. I want two wings to fly away. And then the head of stanza that says, Lord, meet me. Meet me in the middle of the air. And if these wings should fail me, meet me with another pair. Now that somebody didn't know the Lord. There's no failure in him. Why the reservoir of his resources never recedes. The wisdom of his word never wanes. The vigor of his virtue never varies. The burnish of his beauty never blemishes. The lust of his love never lessens. 
the powers of his power never perishes and the fountain of his fullness never fails. There's no failure in him. Whatever the Lord gives you, it won't fail you. I know he has given me salvation and that's not going to fail me. Oh, I'm saved. I'm talking about right now. I'm saved now. I don't have to wait till I come to die. No, I'm saved now. Whew. You know, I get excited about it. When I get to thinking about the Lord has saved me, has given me life that will never end. And somebody right there said, well, preacher, when you come to die, no. I'll just, come, I'll just come down to the line that separates time and eternity, and I'll just step across that line. While I'm over here, I'm asking the Lord to be with me. But when I step across that line, I'll be there where He is. We'll be caught up to meet him in the air. And now, he's not coming back to the earth right then. He's just coming down low enough to affect an airlift. We're going to be caught up to meet him in the air. Not on the earth, but in the air. And then the blessed part about it, there we shall ever be with the Lord. Praise His name. We shall ever be with the Lord. And do you ever think about what it's going to be like to be with the Lord? There we shall ever be with the Lord. You know, some people say, I just like to sit quiet and, 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 and listen. Oh, when we get where the Lord is. Don't expect it to be quiet there. There's going to be shouting. Oh, you know, in seminary they taught me how to stand in one track and hold my Bible. They taught me how to gesture to emphasize certain points. They taught me how to regulate and modulate my voice so it won't be so loud and obnoxious. And you know, I passed the course. <laughs> but when I get to thinking about being with the Lord, I get excited about it. I can't help but shout. We say, why is he hollering? Why is he yelling? Look, you haven't, you haven't seen any shouting yet. You just wait. Until my feet strike Zion. You just wait until I behold his face. Oh, you just wait until I hear him say, Save it well done. You just wait. There we shall ever be with the Lord. Will you be there? Don't fool me. Will you be there? I'll be there when the saints go marching in. Will you be there? I'll be there when the four and twenty elders bow around the altar. Will you be there? I'll be there when they crown him Lord of all. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, we are thankful for your word that's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Our Father, we are thankful for the privilege that we have together here in worship and in fellowship and in praise and in prayer. Oh God, may each person here think on his and her way. Our Father, those here 
who have not accepted you as Savior, we pray that they will do it now. Those who will not acknowledge you as Lord, let them know that you are not going to be their Savior or Lord. But you're going to be Savior and Lord. And our Father, help them to turn, help them to come to Thee. Help them to look to You and live. And our Father, some have gotten weak on the way. We pray that You will renew our strength. We pray that You will allow Your flame and love to defrost our frigid devotion. So we'll be less of what we have been and more of what you would have us be. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.